And uh, tonight I'm joined by Suzanne Thompson, who actually, when I looked up your resume, it had so many descriptors, uh, master gardener, environmental journalist, environmental organizer, uh, uh, Nix the Knotweed coordinator, which we'll talk more about <laughs> later. And um, so, well, welcome anyway, <laughs> to start with. Um, but I invited Suzanne because she kind of got Riverside Park Conservancy excited about a new project that we really hadn't um, thought about. We had thought about some similar things, but she kind of prodded us to take it to the next level. And thanks to the Community Foundation, we had that opportunity. So welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. We have a project. We have a program. We have a series of activities coming along. And uh, it was because of the Conservancy group that willingness to say, yes, let's, let's stay up late and pull together a grant application <laughs> by a deadline. And, Throw it against the wall and see if it, see if we can describe what it is we're trying to do. So I'm excited to be able to explain what we're going to be doing in coming months. Yeah. Today. So I guess I'll ask you what brought you to think about Riverside Park to begin with. Well, uh, I, you know, you talk about me and all the descriptors of everything I am. I, I'm a first and foremost a Kansas farmer's daughter, <laughs> <laughs> misplaced in Connecticut. Um, the corporate carousel stopped here. And I felt very fortunate. Me, wow, what a great place to uh, not be working that much anymore. And so I said, I'm going to go back to journalism. I'm going to go back to gardening. I'm actually going to stay home and raise my kids and get involved in things and be a scout leader and all of this stuff. And I began to get to experience New London County. That I had to learn that we don't do counties in Connecticut. <laughs> well, all you can see the word on paper. It just this, doesn't mean a lot. Right, right. I kept saying, where's the Cooperative Extension Office? And people were like, what? You know, and I'm <laughs> like, wait a minute. But um, so Riverside Conservancy and the park, I realized nature is all around us. And we don't have to go to some beautiful, manicured, botanical garden. I mean, one of the great things about Connecticut is, uh, what, what is the statistic? Everybody's within 10 miles, 10 minutes of some open space, of a preserve, of a park. Maybe it's not been as taken care of as lovingly as it should have been. Uh, maybe there's some invasive plants popping up on it. Or places like fill dirt gets dumped in different places and open spaces. You know, some sometimes that happens. And so it's like, but let's look right in our midst. Let's look what's here. And we don't have to go to the White Mountains to see something. We don't have to go to other places. It's right here in front of us. And a good friend, Petey Reed, ha, um, is always pulling me into different gardening projects. And she's always raved about this place. And so she's, we decided, let's, let's put together this program called A Living Ecosystem. Let's get local families and children and people together. You're, you're right very near the Conn College. You're near the Winter Elementary STEM Magnet School. Coast Guard Academy is right there. There's all these interesting places. Let's just go explore it with people. And, and let's do some oohs and ahs together with, with the native plants that are there and actually enjoy them. And interestingly, there are areas of the park that have been so neglected over the last 50 or 60 years that they don't have many invasive be because the right. ground was not disturbed. Exactly. But, but we stay away from those areas. 
<laughs> oh, okay. in a way. Yes. I mean, recreationally, we don't necessarily, uh -huh. but we don't have to do a lot with those right. areas. Right. But there are other areas that have were disturbed before they were neglected. Exactly. So you have to define what neglect. Sometimes neglect is a good thing. It means human beings haven't mucked it up. Um, but what we plan to do is using the park, using this pavilion that was rebuilt, it's like, oh, we could do outdoor education activities and there's a roof overhead. So we're not fully inside a building. Uh, you know, it rains at the strangest times in Connecticut. So a PD uh, was talking about how she's doing some work there to, to deal with erosion. And I know you're trying to do things with controlling invasive plants and fostering and bringing back native plants. You know, people who have yards and gardens, we're discovering, oh, we need to be growing native plants instead of these exotic things we've all been buying for years. Well, there are a lot of native plants going growing in neglected places. Right. And you don't have to have a, this manicured garden. You don't want a manicured garden. You want to let nature really do its thing. And that's pollinator pathway. We want to encourage the insects and the migratory species, the birds coming through here. We want to provide the habitat for them and enjoy them and watch them. So we're going to put on a series of eight different workshops uh, we'll talk about when the first one is. Yeah. Shall we say that? Well, now? we can give the date. We sure. can give we the date. Yes. Wait. Yes. So it's Saturday, June third. We were going to do it earlier in May, May, and it rained. So. <laughs> so it's it really we had delayed it before that, but boy, was I glad on last Saturday morning uh, that we didn't have to cancel our launch. Right. Right. Because, right. you know, we can. We can deal with drizzle, but heavy rain, and heavy wind, if you get yes. an yes. inch and a half in 24 hours, you're probably not right. going to so on June, attract many people. On June 3rd is going to be the first, the launch of a series of workshops, and we really want to work with people to figure out, they'll probably be Saturday morning things through the summer, but we want to find out from families with kids what makes a good time to do this. I mean, nature is there all the time, and the right. days are long in the summer, So, we, and the pavilion is there. And so the idea, if we can put on a series of different workshops that are hands-on, kids and parents are going to come, grandparents, send the older sibling with them, and, and just learn things. Um, you may leave with some plants. You know, you may leave with some seeds. You don't have to have space to grow things in yourself necessarily. Uh, you, you may dissect some plants and learn different plant parts and things. This is what I got to grow up with as a child, uh, following my father around the farm. And then my mother had to figure out how to cook all the stuff that he grew. And so that's, I want to share <laughs> that with other people. And I don't know as many birds, I'm not a birder. My, I, I know birds, but I'm not good at identifying birds. I'm good at identifying plants. So I hope to bring in some people who know more of the wildlife oh, and can- great tell more of that story. You know, we think, oh, a flower is pretty. Well, no, a flower is a part of a plant. A plant serves a purpose. And something's going to eat it, and something's going to eat that. And it, it's the circle of life that goes on. Water matters, soil matters, all of these things that they're interesting components. And, and I, I want to help share that with other people. And from my point of view, it, it really kind of dovetails with a lot of what our group has been trying to do. As you probably figured out, the first time people go to Riverside Park, like, where is this place? <laughs> How do I get there? Where yeah, do I turn? It, How do it, I it, it, yeah. it, and I do, uh, maybe we can show this, this slide just of the yes. map so people can uh, see. But for a long time, even after I had been to Riverside Park dozens of times, the only way I could do it, I'd go to Hodges Square and I'd go uphill. <laughs> and I couldn't give anyone directions. I just figured. Yes. And so it, it's a little map, bit yeah. of a complicated park, even when you're inside of it. Um, to, it has a, lot, a, a very complicated road network because back in the 1920s and 30s, it was used as a campground. And we found a very old newspaper article that city council had set a rate of like 35 cents a day back in the 20s for people to camp there. Camp. Oh. So that's why there was there was a loop. Uh -huh. But so one of our goals has always been 
familiarize more people with the park. Yes. You know, you live a couple t t towns down the road, not a far, but right. A, not right in New London, but there are a lot of people in New London who don't know where the park is. Mm -hmm. And when it was threatened, uh, was sailed 12 years ago, um, I don't know if people remember the Portuguese fisherman restaurant that used to be in Hodges Square. We, uh, we had an event before the vote because we wanted to bring a whole lot of people to at least see it before they voted. And we asked him if he wanted to come up to the park to sell hot dogs. Yeah. And he said, where is it? <laughs> he was in Hodges Square. Uh, yeah. A local institution in Hodges <laughs> Square. Yes. And he did not know <laughs> where the park was. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and, and it's still kind of a challenge. It's a, tucked out of the way. No one's ever going to come uh -huh. across it by accident. Well, and you know, Pete, you're not exactly allowed to go on to the Coast Guard Academy. You know, right. and, and so you kind of be careful driving around some of these areas going, uh-oh, am I going to, you know, am I, am yeah, I supposed to be here? But what I think is so interesting is the terrain of the place. And so the, the easy thing to remember is get into the park, just keep wandering around, driving around. Don't go to the blue and pink playscape over by the water. Keep going up the hill. Beyond that, look for that uh, pavilion. It's, it's right. green and wood, right? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. like a light moss green. Yeah. Um, so And the exciting thing is, so you have given us a palette to play with. And, and this is the thing. Yeah. Um, you don't, again, you don't have to have this manicured place to watch critters and creatures. So you've got this hillside area that you're trying to figure out and get community what? input in on how can we, and what are you, call, what are you gonna call this area? It's I a, don't know, do you know, uh, 15, 20 years ago and farther back than that, in that area, and I think I do have a, a slide, maybe we can show the second slide, mm -hmm. uh, just showing where the pavilion is and the lot that's across that little right. stub of a road. You're going to turn and, this into Okay, so a, there's the pavilion. Yeah, there, yeah. And the area to the left, people who are old-time New Londoners know there used to be old playground equipment there. Okay. Like seesaws and swings and the springy animals. Uh -huh. And that was taken out maybe 10, 15 years ago. It wasn't the safest. And it was right, kind of yeah. Rusty. And when families picnic in the pavilion, they can't really supervise their kids down the hill on the other at the playscape or right. even on the basketball court. Right. So we are trying to decide what we can have in that particular in the, area and get community input. And so it already was a playground. There's some nice slope to it. There's some nice yeah. old trees around it. Uh, and that's the exciting thing. So we yeah. get to play with that space. We'll do no yeah. harm while you survey the public, get them in the space. And right. yeah, this is the whole thing. When you know, when you move into a new home or place, it's like, don't do anything rash. Just spend some time and, and see the views, see what right. you like. And so if some of us are poking around in the soil and picking up things and looking for insects and things, that's fine. But if parents are saying, yeah, I really... What I want is an area where I can keep track of my right. kids. How about a couple of benches here? Or right. some windy paths in, in spaces. Absolutely. So that's why, the, while uh, P.D. Reed is going ahead and putting in some raised garden beds right. on one side. So uh, we thought, oh, this would be a perfect place just to familiarize ourselves with it, hang out yeah. there more. And, you know, maybe some of those trees are going to be trimmed back or changed. Maybe things are going to change over time. But let's get to know it in the process. Absolutely. So. And we do have two benches uh, already purchased in, sh in storage okay. uh, waiting yeah. for the, you know, decision on exactly where they're going to be put in the okay. ground. So you need input. So, <laughs> so we are looking for input. We're looking yes. to bring people into the park. Yes. And uh, I think... This is a way to do it. Good. Good. So we're, we're really excited about it. So we'll be coming out with more specific details about it, but we know for Saturday, June 3rd, did we decide a time? 10 to 11.30? Uh, 10 to 11.30. Yes. And yes. Uh, we do have a slide that shows a temporary flyer for right. it. Right. Maybe we can show so that. So this is truly a work in progress because it's going to be built on what people right. want to do. And, uh, you know, we had thought, oh, well, let's do it earlier starting in oh, April. Yeah. Well, every weekend has been bad. And, and then all, and people are too busy with other things. And it's more fun to play outside in the summertime. And right. so that's where we want to be sensitive to people's schedules and what works well. So not too early on Saturday. Right. So 
who can get their kids out of the house at nine o'clock in the morning? I don't know. I can't. So I can ten o'clock is just fine. At nine in the morning. And, but, but, and and we also want to see what age and stage who's interested because we want to tailor the activities. Then you can have younger little kids. You've got some middle schoolers that want to come along, or if you've got older siblings kids home from for the summer or something who actually want to help a little bit with it right so it it's our park it's our activity to do and by th some of the fun things that we're going to do uh, we envision by the time you get to November December we will have, s have collected some native plant seeds desired ones we're going to make seed balls and then in December you go out and you toss the seed balls outside and and again you don't you don't have to do this in your own yard. You can come and toss them around Riverside Park because they're desired things to have. But this is where you learn about the cycles of, of plants and their growth patterns. And um, so, that, so those are some of the things we have planned. We might do something pumpkin-esque in the fall. I don't know. It's just going to be fun. We're, we're so excited that the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut chose this to be one of its environmental grants because it does bring people together. Right, and at the same time, it it you know helps remediate the environment in parts yes. of the park that We're, were disturbed, yes. that yes. do have invasive plants, and don't have all of the amenities that right. people might want in their you know in their city park. Yes, yes. So yeah, we are going to get a little work out of you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Bit. It's a it's good stretching exercise. Is it? <laughs> We've been, both been out pulling weeds or cutting oh, off yeah. weeds today, so we, we got in our fitness. Yeah, we got we in will. our steps. And, and we will spend part of this show talking about the weeds we've been pulling. <laughs> and before we start doing that, I have one other park picture. Uh, and it was a diagram that was made when a study was done about a decade ago. Uh, the, the plan was to... Uh, reconnect the north part of New London where the college and the Coast Guard Academy are with mm -hmm. the south end. Oh. And this just shows, in a way, how diverse this park is. It's about, mm -hmm. you know, eight, 18 acres, but, you know, the elevation go it's along the river, but up near Winthrop School, I think the elevation's about 250 feet. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of steep. And there are wooded areas, there are grassy areas, there are playscapes, there are basketball. So it's a complicated, you know, bit of land that we have in the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can get lost in that little space. <laughs> yeah, so you can't see over the hillside to see where someone else is. So, you know, exploring the site is yeah. going to be a part of it to explore it, to figure out what more should be done with it that would make it more attractive to the public. Yeah, yeah. You have to hang out in the space to figure out how you want to utilize it. So um, so watch your website for the, yeah. the Conservancy as well as the Facebook page. And Right, yeah. Um, our website is just riversideparkconservancy.org. Um, some people get confused. There's a Riverside Park in New York City. Yeah, we're not the one in New York we're, City. <laughs> we're not the one in New York City, but every so often I get odd emails from people <laughs> who live on the Upper West Side. But th this is our contact info. And you can do a search on Riverside Park uh, at, on Facebook, but there's also this tiny URL that will bring you to the Riverside Park Great. page. So we'll have updated information info posted all those places and you can just email us it goes to all the board members and one of us is bound to answer pretty promptly yeah yeah good so it's, it's a fun collaboration really looking forward to it so you and i spent much of our day doing uh something very similar activity <laughs> yeah I've, uh pulling weeds and um you know as i mentioned before you know you were one of the originators of the Nix the Knot Weed group locally, which mm -hmm. has kind of gone viral nationwide. It, uh, internationally, actually. Knotweed's a problem everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's a native plant in Japan. It's a food crop. And somebody, a friend of mine, actually got to visit Japan and took pictures of it growing nicely, playing nicely with other plants because it has predators. It has competing plants. 
It was brought over to Europe, to England, oh, in the 1800s as this exotic plant with, with heart-shaped leaves. And it's been around for a while, but it seems, I don't know if it's climate change or what, but all of a sudden we're realizing this stuff is just growing everywhere. And um, so it's a herbaceous plant. It's not a woody plant. And it, because it grows so quickly, it kind of, it, you can chop it off and take the nutrients away from it. You, it's some point, hopefully we're exhausting it. We believe we're exhausting it. We're seeing signs of doing this and we figured out that, and I'll do credit again to P.D. Reed. She told me, I've been doing this for a few years in Pine Grove community in Niantic. And I said, well, that's nice, but I don't have time to chop knotweed. I got a, one kid in soccer and another kid doing this. And as I'm driving along the shore road in Old Lyme, I'm noticing this stuff grow by the hour. You know, in the morning I take them to school, in the afternoon I pick them up from soccer and the stuff has gotten taller. And she says, well, just keep cutting it back. And I'm like, okay, fine, I don't, I don't even get my own garden worked in. COVID hit, we're all stuck at home. Uh, <laughs> you know, nobody could go anywhere and um, gardeners were going in crazy like everybody else, but gardening was declared an essential activity and outdoor yard work was too. So 2020, I said, aha, I'm going to do this. I'm sitting at home. I'm going to go chop down some knotweed. And there was knotweed growing behind Old Lime Town Hall. So I approached on a wetland, right, a hillside above a wetland. I said, can I just experiment with this? And I've got, I've got four or five garden club friends. We want to get together. Can um, <laughs> So we stood apart from each other with our masks on, <laughs> you know, six feet apart. And it was like, if anybody asks us, we're a garden crew, okay? Um, and then the Lime Art Association uh, also had grounds that somebody had mowed it for them. And this knotweed kept growing back. It was like the sorcerer's apprentice. You chop it up and the stems, each little stem sprouts. So we said, what if we get a bunch of volunteers to get out of the house in the evening after we've all been cooped up together we can't go anywhere we're all homeschooling we're you know everybody's at home and we'll just cut this stuff back so three years later we're to the point now where we're we're really seeing is this working or not and have we done it properly should we tweak it should we change it but but the it's a simple idea. You go in and you cut back knotweed, which okay. I have knotweed here. You, and you knotweed is very easy to yes. find because I could have brought some from Riverside Park. Yes. And when I pulled into the parking lot here at the studio, there was yes. a beautiful <laughs> stand of knotweed right next yes. to it. So it's, it's really a very pretty plant. It grows out of nowhere. Um, you'll you, this spring it was it was assaulting to our senses because these stems will shoot up really thick. It kind it, it kind of looks like a cross between rhubarb and asparagus. You know, rhubarb yeah. kind of comes up quickly and the stems are kind of that color, but it gets big heart-shaped leaves. The plants will shoot up, oh, eight to 10 feet tall if you let them. And and the stems are hollow bamboo-esque. They're, they're flimsy as bamboo. They're brittle mm -hmm. now, but in the, in the wintertime, in the fall, the first killing frost kills all the vegetation back because it, it's this tender perennial herbaceous plant. Um, and the bamboo is flimsy. It's not real bamboo. It's just hollow. So that's why the nickname of it is Mexican bamboo. I don't know who thought of that. But um, this is what the plant looks like. It flowers in August. It has racemes, clumps of little flowers. So it's a very pretty plant. The only problem is, is it's a thug. There's it, nothing else can compete with it because it grows up and it shades over everything else. So if you go in and you cut it three times a year, like by Memorial Day weekend, and then come back by around 4th of July, and then a third time, keep cutting back the same plant. You're taking the nutrients away from it. Um, we say August 20th, but we just set it that way to say if you're if you're still cutting it by Labor Day, that's okay. But you get this cycle going of every 30 days or so, you're going in and you're cleanly snipping the plant at the bottom with, with hand loppers, you can. You're not using a weed whacker or the little plastic filament because that'll just shred it into pieces. You don't mow over it with the mower because every one of those little pieces can sprout, can drift that's in the water. That's pretty scary. It is, it's, it's crazy. 
So uh, invasive plants are plants, or invasive species, or species that, that came from another continent that don't have enough predators here. They don't have natural predators. Plants from North America are, are causing problems in Europe. So, and a lot of plants from Asia love it over here. There are Asian relatives. I mean, there's the American chestnut. There's right. an Asian chestnut, a Japanese chestnut. There's Oriental bittersweet. There's American bitter, North American bittersweet, a native. So when the continents all moved apart, it's fascinating to think about how these plants have all changed to adapt to their own environment, their own ecosystem. It's just when they come and visit, a, a small percentage of the plants uh, and insects and fish, other species, don't have any natural predators in control and they go gangbusters. And, and that's what throws off environments. So instead of us going out and spraying chemicals, which only introduces a whole different situation, we're trying these organic methods. They do take time. It's gonna take at least three years of cutting back the knotweed. And then the question is, so what do I do with the cuttings? Because these are propagules. These little pieces, will, these are not, uh, seeds are propagules, but in this case, this is a vegetative propagule. So we could talk about this for hours. I'll, the, the, yeah. short, the short answer is, in the state of Connecticut, we have had incinerators. So you can put your invasive plant propagules or parts in a plastic bag and put it in the trash. And I and think that's New London's uh, regulation right it, now. Yes. If you take Master Gardener program, you learn, okay, invasive plant propagules, the way that you get rid of them is you put them in a plastic bag and you incinerate them in the incinerated trash. Um, don't put them in a landfill. We don't have landfills in Connecticut. Right. We haven't because we incinerate instead. Um, but also don't put it in your compost heap. In, and the same thing is, so this is not weed. You can't put this in your compost because it will sprout. This is Euonymus. Oh yeah, burning bush. Burning bush. It's, you can tell it's got the little wings on the stems. Um, very, you can still buy this. So we have 97, I think it is, in plants that have been declared invasive in the state of Connecticut. The majority of them you're not supposed to move, transport, do anything with other than try to kill them on your own property. Kill them off or control them, don't let them spread. But there are a handful that are still in the horticultural trade. And you're not, Euonymus is still in? Yeah. Because yeah. the, the other bad thing I had heard about Euonymus was that like a Japanese barberry, it can harbor the mice that harbor ticks. Right, the little, is it white-footed yeah. mice? Yeah. Right. So, so, so that so, it's actually uh, perhaps a vector to Lyme disease. Right, so this gets back to a living ecosystem. <laughs> And, you know, I don't know if we'll be talking, get this far talking with the families and kids, but this idea, if you've got a house surrounded by Japanese barberry, which I didn't bring that one in for my cutting today, um, that is a home for, for the little mice that the little deer ticks can live on when they're not living on the deer. So you don't want that environment close to your house. Um, wood chips are actually an excellent thing to put down because deer ticks don't like to be on wood chips. So you don't have well, to, to go know. for mulch. You can do fresh wood chips. So if you have a tree that falls down, you want to chip the tree, or you want to get wood chips from someone and do wood chip paths and things. So to reduce the areas that deer ticks like to hang out on. So, you know, I've always gardened. I've always been around plants. I love plants. Um, for a lot of people I know, they're like, I just want a pretty green yard. And I just want some flowers that pop. You know, I just want pretty color. Um, I'm not. I'm not trying to make this complicated for people. <laughs> <laughs> we we need to find better native plants to grow and introduce into our environment and our yards. And through pollinator pathway, now you can find many more native plants that are good to grow. You can ask for them. You can go to pollinatorpathway.org and do some research online and come up with lists of plants that you want to plant. So we're trying to make it friendly and approachable, um, but then we also have to learn, well, what do we do with the invasive plants? And there is a matter of you do have to try to cut them back or control them or they're just gonna take over. And so. we found a, a few years ago when we had a grant that uh, 
we had big ambitions of, of remediating large portions of Riverside Park. And we did yeah. small portions, but not large portions. And there was one area near the railroad tracks that had a lot of Japanese knotweed. And we did do the cutting back. And we found, now it's, it's actually kept mowed mm -hmm. because uh, there isn't, we can't get water to it. It's hard to even do native flowers. Uh, but some things just are there and hidden. They showed up. And there are goldenrods. There are um, th there was white snake root. There's jewel weed. Mm -hmm. There are some quite aggressive native plants that they're just waiting yes. to stop having to compete right. with if, the likes yes, of this. Somebody would cut this thing out of the way. That it, gets, it, it really shades them out. So so we have the whole nix the knotweed effort. Is it it was. Uh, a campaign to let people know it's Memorial Day weekend. Go out and chop your knotweed. You know, make sure you don't throw it in the compost pile. And then we take every time we go chop knotweed, we take pictures and we post it on our Facebook page. So we have Nix the Knotweed Facebook page. This is all bootstrapped. I've been applying for different grants, uh, but we don't have funding oh, yeah, for communications showing. yet. <laughs> right, and so there, you know, you get together as a group and you go chop your knotweed and we take pictures of it. There's this cute little innocent knotweed right in the bottom in the middle front. Oh, yeah. That's when it was just starting out in like April. Isn't that cute? And then you see over on the left-hand side, the lady, the knotweed is as tall as she is. Six uh, weeks later. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, just, but um, let it exhaust itself. Let it grow up and then cut it down. Then it's going to have to grow up again, and then you cut it down again. Now, okay, uh, and there, there are go. many pictures. There, of yes, of different stages. So the trick is, so what do you do with the cuttings? If you don't want to put them in a plastic bag and put them in the incinerated trash stream, um, if you have a space with a tarp, you can lay them on the tarp, especially in the middle of the summer in the sun. They will dry out quickly. See, isn't it pretty in those pictures? Now, um, we say no native predators. Uh, a pr natural predator of <laughs> knotweed is the Japanese beetle, the green Japanese beetle. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, which I don't want any more green Japanese beetles in my yard eating my roses or anything else. So. The idea of using them as a biological control, no. Yeah, it's <laughs> no. It's like kicking the can down the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, it's, it's one of those situations where in nature, um, native plants are going to be eaten by some animals because they serve that purpose. So as Doug Talamy says, he does the 10-step gardening method. If you have an oak tree, um, it is home for so many different insects. and the, caterpillars, if the birds eat the caterpillars, take 10 steps back so you can't see the bug bites in the leaves of the tree. It's still a beautiful yeah. oak tree. So that's the 10 step gardening method. You know, Doug oh, yeah. Talamy is this University of Delaware professor that has been encouraging people to, to plant native ecosystems. Can I show some other? Yeah, please so, show other yes, weeds. Yes. And, and, and this is a live show. Yes. So if people have questions about weeds. Yes. Uh, well, I must say, you know, get a hold of your, look for the new London County Master Gardener uh, organization. It's, it's up in Norwich, and Master Gardener interns are there to answer your questions in person or over the phone. Um, so they keep summer office hours as Master Gardeners. You can bring in samples of things. But our phones, whereas our phones are now, there are so many wonderful apps now for searching for plants. And a free one is iNaturalist. And, the, and it's got a, a lightened version of that called Seek. But the cool thing about iNaturalist from, um, you, you, um, you put in the picture of the plant and it'll tell you what it thinks it is, but then another volunteer or person comes and will try to ID it for you. And so yeah. you can ha be in a, it may take a day or two, it's, it's like an online game, uh, and you can get in a conversation with them, you know, a little bit. So <laughs> you can yeah. even take an, we need to set Riverside Park up as an iNaturalist project oh. area, and people can run around and take pictures and upload them, and we're doing an online album oh, of what is. we found. So that's some of the stuff we can do in the workshop. I'm, I'm sitting here holding this. This is a pretty one. Yeah, it smells good, too. The common name is Dame's Rocket. It looks like a phlox, but it's not. And you're going to see this blooming right now. So this thing spreads by seed, by flowers. 
So let it look pretty bloom now, cut it off. Cut it off, stick it in a bag. You, as long as the seeds have not set and the flowers haven't turned into little seeds, then you could let something like this compost down. But if you get later in the season and there's little seeds and fruits on there, the last thing you want to do is put those outside right. in a compost situation because they're going to grow. And many seeds last for years. Speaking of, plant with seeds. So Dame's Rocket, you're going to see that purple off purple off white right. off purple yeah it's yeah. all different shades different from, shades like almost white too. so so and this is the problem so many of our invasive plants are here because they're pretty to us yeah. um now this and oh. for as difficult as it is it sure wilted when i brought it in but th this doesn't do it justice this is japanese or oriental bittersweet and this has already set little seeds now so be very careful um, when you're actually the kind of, these are little flowers that haven't quite set the seeds yet you'll recognize the seeds they're reddish on the inside with the right. little orange holes that pop around them they do have a lot of vitamin C for birds but <laughs> but these will strangle trees so so bittersweet if you've got it growing around a tree go at the bottom and cut it off at the bottom so it doesn't keep growing and strangling the tree you know, so, so this is already setting seeds right now, but if you see little bittersweet shoots yeah. coming out, pull them out of the ground so they don't become big plants. And you can tell because they have orange roots, characteristically yeah. orange roots. So again, this is some of the fun stuff that we want to show families and kids that different plants have different colored root systems and different seeds and different flowers. But this, this dear vine is quite long. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it also grows fast. And, and I have a question about that. There is a native bittersweet, but does it still ex well, exist? Well, you know, the real question is, it, can it be found? Does it exist? And what happens is they hybridize. And you could, you could go, they, they crossbreed with each other. So I would say 90% of the time the bittersweet, bittersweet that we're seeing is the oriental bittersweet. Um, the same thing with Phragmites. Phragmites australis is a, an invasive plant that was brought over as ship bilge water. And there is a native Phragmites that is not, because it has natural predators here, it doesn't choke everything else out. So um, chances are, especially if you're dealing with disturbed soils, roadsides, top filled dirt soil that you've gotten from somewhere else, kicked up edges of playgrounds and stuff, those are disturbed soils and that's where the invasive plants are going to get going first and they grow big quicker than everything else. So that's why, that's why yeah. and if you've got them on the edge of your yard, you're going to notice the birds eat the seeds, the birds poop out the seeds and darn it if there's not a bunch of little bittersweet growing underneath your cedar tree. You know, so every spring you go out and you pluck those things out. And this is the interesting thing. You know, we, we think, oh, we got to go spray everything and just kill everything off. No. If you learn different seasons and different times, there's a time to do different things. Like the knotweed. You cut it Memorial Day, 4th of July, and in August. Don't waste your time in September because the nutrients have already gone back down into the root ball. So you might as well go do something else at that time. The same thing, the first thing to pop out in the spring is multiflora rose, which I didn't bring with me because it's thorny. But you can, that's the first green stuff you see under the trees in the forest. If you have that, then you can go weed wrench that out. You can pull that out, dig that out. Um, and because your native plants aren't up and awake yet. So and of course the deer don't eat the multiflora rose, so it's choking everything else out. So, and, and I told you before, my, you know, I don't know, my current <laughs> enemy at Riverside Park is Japanese hops, and I don't see it in a lot of other locations. Yeah. But there are a few different spots in Riverside Park where there's a lot of it. I think it's an annual, so if you can get it all out before it, it forms seed, uh -huh. then areas where we pushed it back from uh, 
early in the season last year. Uh -huh. We get a random plant or two. Okay, and that's just but, stay on but, top but, of it, but, yeah. it, but areas we didn't get to that we know flowered and seeded, we okay. had areas like maybe a foot in diameter that had a hundred little seedlings in it. Yes, so Very they're dead, prolific. Uh, Tons of, of seeds and it twines and it's kind of a hairy, okay. hairy stem. So, so I had not heard of Japanese hops until you mentioned it. It's, it's not on that sanctioned list of no. Connecticut, but it might be added, you know, but at might, some at point. But this all gets back to if you have, and there are weeds, there are plants that are native plants that just crowd everything else out. A weed, by definition, is the plant in the wrong place. My father never met one of those. He, you know, <laughs> yeah. If it's growing all, we're going to leave it here. But um, if you don't want it there, go ahead and remove it from that place. Right. And just pay attention. If it spreads by seeds, make sure you cut off the seeds. Put them in a plastic yeah. bag and get them out of there. If it spreads by roots and rhizomes like the knotweed does, be very careful. You know, if you dig up the roots and throw them on the side of the road, you have just spread that plant. You, you don't do that. So um, it's a little bit of understanding plant biology and botany, and I find that interesting. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so what so else, what else do, we have? do you have in so, your bucket? By the way, so I ha this is really interesting. Apparently, you know, we had that cold snap the other day, a couple a week or so ago. Oh. This knotweed is uh, it got frosted. Wow. So, so you're going to see, like on a sloping hillside, especially now. I've never seen any other plants that got somebody said some hydrangeas got a, a nip of wow. frost and somebody set their tomatoes out too early don't put your tomatoes out before memorial day just be patient but you'll see the brown leaves i thought somebody had gone out and sprayed herbicide on it yeah which, because sometimes roundup makes it look it, yeah that's what they uh, sort of shriveled like that it, exactly so what they do on the on the chemical herbicides they put a desiccant on it so they make it brown up and look ugly uh, but this is an example, higher up on the tips are frosted, lower down isn't. So that meant there was a cold bit of air. And, and I was like, oh no, somebody sprayed the side of the road. And somebody said, no, I've seen this all the way up to Maine and back. Uh, wow, that's They had a, had a road trip to do. So we actually did have a nipping frost on things. So that's the knotweed with the nipping frost. It's, it's going to survive just fine. But that's what frosted yeah. leaves look like. And then, and the other nemesis we're all dealing with now, oh gosh, tree yes. of heaven, Alanthus, and it's. This, I'm sorry, this isn't smell o vision. It, it stinks. It looks like a walnut tree, but go crush the leaves and. Yeah, it's like rancid peanut butter. Or yes, something. rancid it's, peanut butter is a very good description of it. They're pretty. Um, they grow. They can grow 60, 70 feet tall. But they are the host, they are the favorite plant of the, the Japanese lantern fly that's coming oh. in. Oh, that, that, yes. Yeah. And they're, they're in Connecticut. They're down in, in, in Fairfield Co County. Yes, yeah. right. yes. Um, and they're all over Pennsylvania. I have friends in Philadelphia who, say, who have said, even a couple years ago, I mean, you they could, had like, right. all over the place. So I was traveling through the Newark airport last summer an early morning flight, and we're dragging our suitcases, <laughs> and the lantern flies were coming through. And I'm running around, dragging my suitcase, trying to stomp on them. Well, they're, they're, they're little dark gray bugs. When they start to fly, they have beautiful pink and, and kind of pink and beige and black striped underwings. But when they close back up, they look like a little morph ranger kind of thing. They're, oh, wow. and they're kind of round bodied little they're not delicate at all and they crunch when you step on them but they <laughs> they jump and they fly so here i am trying to drag my suitcase and stomp on them at the same time <laughs> and my husband is like would you just get in the trolley car and get to the airport like no i have to call the new jersey department of agriculture and report them <laughs> so i did i i googled on the app and they said sure enough please we flew back a week later and they were all gone so they had passed through, but they eat a lot of other trees and fruits. And so that is going to be an invasive insect pest that is going to be sweeping through, passing through. And, uh, you know, it's, it's serious. Um, yes, we have so much f food and things that we transport all around the globe. They're very careful. 
and they handle an inspection points on that. that. That's why they don't let you come into the country carrying an apple or something right. like that. You're saying, oh, it's just a benign apple. It could be carrying a worm of something. It could introduce a pest that we don't realize about. So, so. So, are there any weeds we've missed? Not in this collection. Okay. That was my exhaustion. We did, we did a cutting of at the Lyme Art Association in Old Lyme. And that's been a really fun project there because we're in our third year of cutting. And the plants that have popped back, we've been documenting. We've got some pictures on our Facebook page. Um, we have a YouTube channel. I need to add more videos to the YouTube channel. But you mentioned jewel weed. Cattails are coming back. Uh, the lobelia, right. the cardinal flower, is coming back. Um, elderberry are popping up. Some wild lettuces, which are tall and crazy, and like, well, that's a weed, but no, it's, an, it's a native plant. Daisy fleabane, um, elderberry are in there as well. Deer tongue, and the knotweed is kind of like stunted. It's not gone, so we have to stay at it. But now we're wading through and snipping it out. Uh, it's not like it was where we're chopping down eight foot tall right. branches and of monoculture. We're seeing something similar in, in areas in the Riverside Park where we've yeah. been chopping it and this is, this maybe this is the third year or the second year depending yeah. on where. Yeah. And we are seeing things, you know, asters, goldenrods. Right. Um, yeah. So it works. Things. You have to be patient. And if there was any benefit of us all being locked down with COVID, more people started paying attention to nature around them. Um, more people tried gardening now. Uh, and, and more people are continuing and trying to do that. So uh, we really, but all the other activities of life are kicking back in. But, but there are so many good resources. I mentioned pollinator pathway already. Master Gardener programs are good. Uh, I'm a member of a group called Wild Ones. We have the Mountain yeah. Laurel chapter of Wild Ones, and we do things with Con College. We hold Saturday morning programs, and uh, we advocate for and experiment with planting with native plants and landscaping with them. I think there was a very good plant sale last year too. <laughs> yes, we have good plant sales, and also teach each other how to collect. And you have to dry out seeds when you collect them and harvest them. So I hope some. I think some Wild One members will be helping us with the seed collection for the living ecosystem oh, nice. and making the seed ball activities. Yeah. Well, we have like five minutes left five or si seven minutes left. So I guess we should talk a little, go back, uh, uh, circle back a little. And, and a large part of the point of doing this, this series is uh, not just the environmental remediation and not just to get feedback on what's happening, uh, what will happen in the park, but to inspire a new generation of, of stewards. Yes. So what are we looking at like in the future? Like yes. what are the goals? What, what, what values do we want to impart really? to the next generation? Well, you know, um, what, what's really unique about New England, and if people haven't gotten outside of New England, I, mean, I, I moved here 20 years ago, the land trust ethos. So each town is supposed to have urban or rural communities supposed to have open space and have preserves and land trusts, urban parks or outdoor spaces. But that with that comes a stewardship mentality where people are volunteering to groom trails, put the markers back up, um, deal with the invasive plants, replant some plants. And we've got a lot of old stewards you know, it's <laughs> we, yeah. need, we need to, to, to we grow need some ones. new ones. Yes. And it's, it's tough to squeeze everything in. You've got your years of sports and activities, and those can be so all-consuming for kids and families. Uh, but, but we want to keep people outdoors, active, feeling a sense of ownership of something that is a community resource like Riverside. So... Uh I'm going to ask to put our survey up on the screen. Oh, yes. Uh, you already saw Riverside Park Conservancy or to go to the face, 
Facebook page, and there will be more details about mm -hmm. uh, the program. So you're asking people to fill out a survey online or QR code or, or when they come or, by? Or, or, or a paper one. And right. Some, one person got hold of a paper one, and uh, then he there took a is. phone picture and okay. texted but, the picture. So they get to weigh in on what do, we, what do you want to see done with this space next yeah, to the pavilion. The yeah. The and previous playground, which is right now just an area that has topsoil in it and plants well, growing. Well, it's got and fill. I wouldn't it's quite. It's got fill. It's, okay, it's we're being generous. generous. To call okay. it so, topsoil, but, uh, you know, children's uh, active play, children's creative play. Uh, okay. And yeah. is there funding that's going to come for doing um, equipment no. and stuff? Well, yeah, there's we funding. We, yeah, we have to go get it. <laughs> we have to go get but it. But okay. it, it, it'll prioritize what we're asking for. Because sure. we do get money from Community Development Block right. Grant yes. and, and other you know, mm -hmm. other kinds of grants. Mm -hmm. and But we want it to be what the neighbors and what New Londoners right. really want. Yes. And whether it's adult exercise or kids exercise or outdoor art or musical right. instruments or garden paths or, yeah. you know, whatever. Just, just to be able to walk over there and have that. And, you know, that's one of the unique things of Riverside Park is because it's not that easy to get to. It really is a neighborhood park. It really can be a great resource, yeah. a, a well-kept secret almost, you know, because if it, people miss going up the hill, <laughs> yeah, they, they've missed it. It's <laughs> a pretty glorious neighborhood it park. Is. It isn't it is. quite a destination park. Uh -huh. It might have been at one time because it was twice as big at yeah. one time. It was 35 yeah. acres, but it's just a really a glorious neighborhood park yeah. that people outside the neighborhood don't know much about. Yeah. And uh, we do have, I know we only have two minutes. Maybe we can put up the one yeah. slide that also has things about the program. Okay. Uh, yes. Just information about, you know, it's not a child care program. People, That's correct. Uh, the, the kids have to have someone with them supervising to play with them yeah. and learn C with them. Come and stay with your child because you're going to, or your grandchild, you're going right. to get to go home maybe with some plants or some goodies or some seeds. <sighs> and, and the thing is definitely dress for it. Um, yes, there are deer ticks wandering around. Yes, there's going to be mosquitoes and other stuff. So sturdy shoes. Pull Poison on the rubber. ivy is Poison in, the, ivy? in yeah. the park as well. We're going to try to get it out of that area, but right. it's all over. Well, maybe we'll practice trying. Jewelweed is a natural antidote to <laughs> poison ivy, I understand. If you make a poultice and rub it on where you got it on the poison, we'll, ha we'll have soap and water too. Yeah. Okay, but right, now this is really a chance to do hands-on things, something not too early on a Saturday morning. You know, get out, enjoy the park. If the weather's not ideal, we have the roof of the pavilion. Right. And every season, there's going to be something different. So we hope people tell friends and neighbors about it and say, let's go do this. Um, and then hang out in the park afterwards. Yeah. You know? And, okay. you know, Neighbor Day was just a couple days ago in the park. And a lot of people just hung out in the park. We had kids' art activities, you know, art yes. supplies. Mm -hmm. And we had some... You had fun. It, it was. Right. It, we had snacks. We had fun. So, uh, well, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, and there are uh, a lot of places you can go for more info, including Nix the Knotweed, <laughs> including RiversidePartConservancy.org. Uh, there's so much information about it, but it is important uh, that we t start taking care of our environment. So thanks so much. My pleasure. would love to come back. And next week... Um, well, we'll take a little bit of a left turn. Uh, Becca Atkins and um, Emma Palsy Ray are going to be my guests. They are from Art Reach, an organization in Norwich that does dramatic arts for to promote mental health. So we'll see you then. And thanks again, Suzanne. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>
Don't 